Band, maar uh, sinds kort is daar verandering in gekomen, want hun eerste cd, de Tennessee Fire, staat op nummer 1 van de moordlijst van het muziektijdschrift Oor. Een toonaangevende lijst voor muziekliefhebbers. En vandaag is zelfs hun foto te zien in verschillende landelijke dagbladen. U kunt ze zelf horen spelen via Radio Rijnmond vanuit onze eigen studio. Tennessee Fire um, is on a high place in that alternative hit parade. Record of the year, or some other journalist said. Uh, and so on and so on. It's more or less. Yeah. yeah. Ooh, what about that one? What's that first paragraph say? Jim James gets compared with the young new young. Wow. Bruce Springsteen, Brian Wilson from the Beach Boys. The atmosphere, the playing, and the songs. Uh, call for uh, adjectives as mysterious, full of passion and breathtaking. Some of my favorite adjectives. Absolutely. The young, the young is good. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> cool, cool. Everything is great. I don't, I don't understand a word of it, but it's great. And you must come to Ahoy. You know Ahoy in Rotterdam? Uh, no. Uh, when you are. Uh, One or two years, you are in Ahoy, that's, that's for 15,000 people, yeah. and everybody's going like, ah!
we got to Holland? Well, uh, I just got an email one day from Ben Kamsma at the Paradiso, and he said that uh, people were liking the album over here, and uh, they wanted to bring us over for a little tour, so we talked for a while, and just came down to getting the tickets and getting on the plane coming over. My morning jacket has existed probably like eight or nine years. Just started out as me playing songs acoustically. We've been together like this for about a year, a little less than a year. And how many shows did you do before you arrived in Holland? I'd say we've done somewhere in the neighborhood of 20, collectively as a band, somewhere in that neighborhood. <laughs> Music's my life. It's always been my dream. It's a thrill to get to come over here and, and do it for people. Because it's fun to do it in your hometown, but I'm a question mark here. You know, nobody knows my past, and that, that's okay. that's a good thing. That's what we need. We need our first uh, first beer. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds good. You pronounce beer the same way, don't you? Just beer. The average day in Kentucky is uh, I get up in the morning, drive out 64 East to my bagel store where I work uh, with my friends. Uh, everybody that works there is really cool. Uh, we're all, it's a real friendly atmosphere. I deliver bagels, I seed bagels, I sell bagels and cut bagels, and uh, then I do dishes and leave. And then when the day's my woman's in town, we just find each other and spend the rest of the day together and the night, and, uh, and then it repeats. Uh, when she's not in town, I get off work and go home and write some songs and just play around. And here lately, we've been moving, so I've been constantly moving stuff from one house to the next. But a typical day just consists of either work and then music, or work and girl, or work and girl and music. Bagels, sweet bagels. They're chewy and filling. Back where I come from, we have big bins full of bagels, you know? Yeah. We have uh, spinach and uh, cinnamon and raisin and uh, plain wheat. What kind of bagels do y'all have? Sesame. 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 <laughs> My favorite bagel is taking a honey wheat bagel, cutting it in half, putting eggs on it, and cheese, and salt. Yeah. That's what I eat every morning for breakfast at the bagel shop. Eggs, cheese, and salt. <laughs>
Well, I mean, that's for my grandparents. They should live. And uh, when I was growing up, my parents would, you know, they had to work. You know, both of them work very hard still, you know. So they would drop me off my grandparents, you know, and they would babysit me when I was younger. How big is Pleasureville? Man? Oh. Very small. Yeah? Yeah, they got, uh, they got a bank. They got a pool hall. They got a gas station. They just got a new fish restaurant, but uh, I mean, as far as like you know, the people. All the priorities. Yeah, a yeah. lot of pool table. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> bank. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't sound so bad. What did your grandparents do? Uh, grandfather was a farmer. Tobacco farmer, mostly. At what age did you start picking tobacco? Probably five or six, something like that. Just pulling plants. I mean, anybody can pull plants. You know. I couldn't do much. But, you know, as I got older, they put me to work in other areas. You know, I hated every minute of it, but I did it. You know. That's work. That's right. That's why you know I prefer to play drones you know, and a rock and roll band. You know. What a life that would be, you know. Be nice. We don't get uh, tour support from the label because right. they're just so small. Right. You know. Well, usually we don't it. really either. So. Yeah. So that's that's what we're saying. You know, we we like to do something like you guys do. Mm -hmm. You know, get in with a good booking agent, mm -hmm. see if we couldn't get out there on the road a little bit in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Did you approach him and say we need help, or did he see you guys, or how did that I think he about? saw us play. Or something that, like yeah, that. that helps. Yeah, it definitely helps. Yeah, it would help if we played outside of Louisville until now, too. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that would probably help us out a lot. But well, we what? played Chicago. That's yeah, right. that's yeah. a great play. Where'd you play in Chicago? Uh, Fireside and Bowl. Mm. Old bowling. Don't know a really it. old bowling alley. Oh, cool. Uh, yeah. All right. Yeah, it was, it was just uh, <clears throat> really small. No publicity at all. Mm. None. Well, I know an excuse. excuse. Nobody, nobody knew we were there. I know it, was just, it was just kind of like an excuse for an adventure, like Tom says. <laughs> yeah. you know, we, all, we all pile in the Dodge Dart and just drive. <laughs> you know. <laughs> You make it up there, you make it back. It's a good deal. Yeah. You know? I love Chicago. It's a great place to play. Yeah, she was a young girl. Now the age of 23. Somehow the Lord never smiled down upon her. So she flew out. Stuff is just like they keep playing everything out over and over and over again, and it's like you either got your rap and R&B artists who, who, to me, are just playing the same theme, same themes and the same beats. Only the beats are getting weaker and weaker, and the singing's getting weaker and weaker. It's almost like it's just a status symbol. It's like I, I don't see what distinguishes one act from another because they're all doing the exact same thing so and the same with popular uh, like top 40 rock and roll bands and stuff like that it's like they're all doing such the same formula music seems like it just turned into a game it's just like the the guys in the office at the big record company went out and said okay there's four good-looking guys, we're going to give them some guitars and some drums and show them these songs we've got written out here. Our demographic shows that these songs are the best to sell for this period in time. So they give them to the bands, you know, and, and those bands are just pushed and pushed and pushed. 
and so many people it doesn't really matter what they hear they just hear it on the radio over and over and over again it becomes ingrained in their mind and they buy it if you're an artist that just just likes music there's there's also the indie scene but lots of times people in the indie scene especially in America I don't know how it is over here but there's they're really stuck up really high on themselves and don't like to let new people in or, or new ideas they just like they like what's there and they like what their friends do no matter what it is and that's it and and since they're the ones that have the money and the leverage and the labels they put out all the zines you know and and the, everybody picks up on that stuff more you know so you get more people buying it and more people going to the shows I just think that that music is turned away from music it's like people go to shows just because they know that their friend is going to be there or they'll see that guy they like you know and, and they'll they'll just be able to connect with people which is cool but I just think that, that people have been forgetting about music lots of times I feel really connected with you know like Van Morrison you know Neil Young of course the, the Flaming Lips the band, the Stones, the Beatles, Zeppelin. I just feel a, a strong, strong bond w with that kind of music just because it's the music that, that I think means the most to everybody as a whole. You could sit an old person down with Metallica and they, they just wouldn't like it because it's too much for them, it's too much for their ears. You know, you could sit a young person down with like Lawrence Welk, you know, and they, they would be bored and think it was goofy and stupid. But I think you could sit almost anybody down with, you know, certain selections from the Stones or the Beatles or something, and they could just kind of sit there and listen to it, and it wouldn't hurt them to listen to it, you know? And they'd just say, wow, that, you know, that was good. So that's where my morning jacket is aiming at. That's Timeless where, quality. That's where we try to aim, yeah, I guess. Hopefully, I don't know. That's where we try, you know. That's the area to shoot for, I guess. because that's when I get weird and intense. I try to just forget about what, what it is or where I am. Sometimes that's harder than other times. But that's my favorite is when everything's right and all the sound's on and all the everything's going good, it turns into just one big blob of like orchestrated noise when the performance is going right. It's just like and then the show's over. It's like if everything's going good. But if it's going bad, you know, the guitar sounds too crackly, you know, and everything's slightly out of time. Just weird, not necessarily bad, but just mediocre. I don't think we've ever played a show that I was totally not, just totally unhappy with. I've always been, you know, pretty happy with most of our shows. But it's just that, that moment in time when it's all going right. It is so incredible. The, just the feeling of orchestrated magic. That, that comes out when everything is right. Is that the best feeling in the world? Mm. Love. That and love. Right there. Neck and neck. Those are two great feelings. <laughs>
crazy dreams. Uh, they're so messed up and so colorful of water slides and bouncy balls and just different animals and places and just really colorful lands and stuff that I love spending time there. You know? It's it's fun almost to go to sleep because I know that I'm gonna get a good dream probably. Like the worst dream I ever had. I was on a playground and uh, I was running up a sliding board and I had a fork in my hand and at the top of the sliding board there was this poodle like barking and I took the fork and I stuck it in his eyeball and his eyeball like did this weird bubbly thing and it just bubbled and like popped all over me. And I woke up, and for some reason, that was like just really scared the shit out of me. I, I have dreams of like people that fly down from the sky, like in, in the song, going to hell. Just like kind of end of the world kind of thing, you know. And people riding horses down from heaven, you know, and hell, and just everything blowing up on fire, and just everything all fucked up. I don't know, and it's just kind of from the guy's point of uh, he knows that that's coming and he knows that he's going to hell you know he knows that they're coming from him and they're for him and there's uh, absolutely no hope you know of, of you know redeeming himself or whatever there's just this weird doomed feeling that that i get sometimes i don't think i'm going to hell i hope not
So, but you're sure your parents won't like it? It's not that... I don't think it's because they can't, you know, respect drawings. You know what I mean? I mean, they, they can respect art, you know. They just don't care for it on people's bodies. So, why is that again? Well, I mean, they're very religious. Uh, Southern Baptist. And, uh, you know, it's, uh... Religious thing of, you know, thou shalt, thou shalt not deface thy body, you know. And this is defacing the body. So, when you got your first tattoo, what did they say? Oh, they're mad. They're really mad. They just, they didn't say much at all. They were just like, you know. Mad. So mad they didn't say anything, I guess. You know? But, uh... Yeah. So you're gonna expect trouble when you get home? Yeah, I do. Yeah. But, uh, What are you gonna do? What did your dad say to you when you got the first one? Uh, he... Threw a newspaper. Yeah. Left. Yeah, he was, he was real mad. What did he say about getting another one? Yeah. Well, he told me, basically, if you get another tattoo, don't come home. Yeah. I don't know, I guess we'll, we'll see if he lets me come home. I hope he does. I hope he does. Sore? Too bad. No problems with drumming. No, no. You can break a leg, still draw. Yeah.
big. It's got several different options, several different pockets. Here we got my trusty Walkman. My standard government issue police sunglasses. The Vera magazine. Featuring a my morning jacket. <laughs> got some books, The Wisdom of Insecurity. Haven't read that. Flatland, haven't read that. No time to read over here, right? No, uh, no. Our tickets, Life, the Universe, and everything. Haven't read that. I, I haven't had time to read much. Uh, the Witches, haven't read that. Uh, then I got my dirty bag filled with uh, underwear and socks. Man, it's bad news. Got a book here that my my woman made me uh, for our anniversary, and it's just got pictures and stuff inside it. But I'm not gonna reveal any of those pictures. No? So, so uh, are they X-rated? No, no, they're not <laughs> X-rated. Uh, I'll show you a little something. Left it at home. That uh. We made some cards together. They're called a, a Tyrone cards. These are just a couple of them. We made them there at home. They're covered in some gauze and lamination and stuff, kind of like tarot cards, but uh, kind of a, a uh, joke about tarot cards. That's her. That's my girlfriend. <laughs> When she was little, of course. Joe was born in New York City Son of Paul and Catherine Always down and always out But his morrows always seem just fine There will be bigger has taken on a whole new meaning for me now. It's kind of like a dedication to my to my woman, you know, saying that, that I'll be there forever. You know, all my life I always wanted somebody that could, uh, that I felt I could love and that could love me honestly. I'd always dated people that were nice, but they always felt like they had to, to laugh at my jokes and I always felt like they had to agree with everything that, that I was saying. You know, you, you want somebody who can disagree with you. They don't have to share the same opinions you do, but they can still love you for who you are. And, and I, I finally found that person, thankfully. But I guess there's some things that you can't escape in your head, you know, like melancholy and stuff. I used to be much more melancholy And uh, just around the time that, that I wrote the songs and stuff, and it's just very recently things have changed to make me happier. But with the happiness comes the paranoia because you don't know when you're going to lose those things that you've gotten. You know, not necessarily constant paranoia, but it's it's like a new melancholy. Is that the same with this trip over here in Holland? Did you think, well, pinch me? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I was 